welcome to this episode of Keith Morris at the Movies. In this episode, I will review a movie called The American Society of Negroes. Yes, that is the actual name of the movie. I didn't make this up. Someone actually put pen to paper and came up with that. So, without further delay, let's get into it. And you might ask yourself, what is a magical Negro? Well, the magical Negro is a motif. It's an actual thing. It's a concept, if you will. Um, in cinema, the magical Negro is a supporting character who helps to come to the aid of the white protagonist or the li uh, white leading character in a movie. The magical Negro characters often possess some special insight or mystical powers. Um, that has been the tradition in American fiction. The old fashioned word Negro is used to imply that a magical black character who devotes himself to selflessly um, helping white people is a throwback to racist stereotypes such as you might have heard of Little Black Sambo, Old Black Joe, Mammy. Um, the term, the term magical Negro uh, was made popular again in 2001 by Spike Lee. And we all remember Spike Lee and love the movies that he's put out. Um, during a lecture tour of college campuses when he was going across the country, um, Spike expressed his dismay that Hollywood continued to employ this, this premise <clears throat> that it hadn't moved on. And I guess Hollywood is saying, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he specially, specifically noted the film's Green Mile. You remember Green Mile with Mr. Duncan and oh, these, these angels, these angels, and um, helping. Um, he could solve everybody's problems, solve murders, solve, you know, do anything for anybody, um, had these special powers. But he couldn't free himself, which I thought was interesting. Um, the Legend of Bagger Vance, remember that with Matt Damon and Will Smith before he um, did what he did, but Will Smith was the one that helped him be a better golfer. Well, why, why couldn't Will Smith help himself be the better golfer? He could have been Tiger before Tiger. He could have been Lee Elder or um, Trevino before them, you know, but you know, that's what happens, you know. It features a super duper magical Negro with mystical powers that helps the, the white character. So the American Society of America of Magical Negroes is called a comedy a fantasy. Um, I would dare add tragedy, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in this review. Um, it is the motion picture and writing debut of Kobe Libby. Um, it stars Justice Smith as Aaron, um, and David Allen Greer, I did like his performance as Roger, as well as a host of others. Um, the movie centers around Aaron, and Aaron is recruited into a, a secret society of magical Black people who dedicate their lives to a cause of the utmost importance. And what is that? It's making the lives of white people easier and better. Let's pause. I will inhale. I will exhale. And let's resume. That pretty much is the definition of the magical Negro, right? Now, the first thing I ask myself is, why was this movie even made? Who was it made for? What is it really trying to say? Is this movie necessary now, in these times that we're going through? And again, why was it made at all? Was there a need for it? Who approved this? Who signed off on this? Um, now the movie was very slow in the beginning, but towards the middle, it picked up quite a bit. Um, Pace-wise, I mean. Um, I enjoy, again, I enjoyed the performance of David Allen Greer. Um, he made the movie tolerable when it was going through some of the slow spots. And a lot of what happened in the movie was very offensive. I, I'm just going to tell you, you know, spoiler alert, you, you, you're going to be ticked off. Um, it was offensive to black people because it actually played on many of the racist stereotypes about black people. You know, and so, you know, it's not like it was an advocate or, you know, you don't 
advocate against, you placate it, you almost sanction it like it's the way it is until, you know, they, they clean it up, I guess, try to clean up at the end or bring it to an end. But the premise of the movie in a nutshell was that there was a secret association of black people who were granted magical powers to keep white people from getting angry because an angry white person is the most dangerous creature in the world. Um, the main character is recruited into this organization. He says he has been trying to please and appease white people his entire life. And now it is literally his job. Oh, I guess he was in heaven. Um, he falls for a woman who looks white, but they let you know in the movie that she's she has some ethnicity. So I call it the generic ethnic other. Um, the caveat is that all powers will be lost by all magical black people if any, one, just one person in the society puts their own interests above their white clients. So Aaron ends up falling for this woman who I say looks white, but, you know, see, anyway, he falls for this woman. And the problem is one of his racist clients is also interested in this woman as well. So, you know, technically he's supposed to bow out and, and help him get her so he's happy or whatever. Um, and, and here's a spoiler alert, if I haven't told you too much already, if you haven't seen it. Um, Aaron chooses this woman over his society. He ends up coming of age, determines there is a space for him on this planet, and that it is not the, his responsibility to make people who are uncomfortable with him feel better. In a nutshell, man joins a black society of sellouts. He sells out the sellouts for a woman who looks white, comes of age as a man, stands up for himself, and lives happily ever after. Okay, let's talk about this. When a subject like this is taken on, you have to be spot on. You know, you, you have to hit the target. Um, American Fiction did this for me, and that's why I thought that's one of the best movies I've ever seen. Um, it tackled a different subject masterfully, using irony and satire, comedy, um, to get his point across. Didn't hit you over the head hard, but it, it, it got his point across in subtle ways. Um, this movie, I think, attempted to do something similar, and it failed, and the failure was epic. Um, this, this movie had a lot of potential, I believe, but it went for cheap laughs and silliness and fell short of what I believe the writer intended it to do. So I think I understand where the writer was trying to, to do, as a matter you know, you look at it, you're like, what, what was he trying to say, Keith? And I will use my real life example of what I believe the, the writer was trying to convey, the whole premise of this movie. Um, so it was the mid-1980s. Um, I was in the United States Air Force. Um, I was leaving Keesler Air Force Base and um, tech school in, in Biloxi, Mississippi to go back home to see my parents in Chesapeake, Virginia. I had missed Christmas. I had a very long tech school. And so I was excited to, to to get home after basic training and tech school. So I flew out of Dallas Fort Worth Airport, caught a um, um, bus, caught the bus to, to from Biloxi to, to Texas. And I remember it, it was a Delta flight because I have never flown Delta since. Um, I was wearing my class A's, you know, a dress, blues, looking sharp because I wanted to impress my mother. Um, and so while boarding the plane, this white guy was sitting in my assigned seat. And so I politely showed him my ticket and told him he was in my seat. And he just stared at me. And so I'm trying to get home. You know, I'm not trying to start a commotion. I'm not trying to yoke him up out the seat. So I go to the stewardess, you know, try to do the, the, the respectable thing. And told her what was going on. And so she looked looked at the guy and said, and asked him to, to leave, to move to his seat. This joker turned his head and ignored her like she was nothing. And so, you know, she called security. They yoked the guy off the plane. And no, that's not what happened. She looks at me tearfully, beat red, and inconvenienced me. 
ask me, can you just wait in the aisle? And, you know, it, there's this flight isn't full, so if there's an empty seat, you can take it then. And I just looked at her, and I, and I was like, and I really didn't want to do it. And, you know, she was like, oh, I'll give you drinks. And, I'll, and she was selling it on me, and I just said, whatever. But I was bothered. And I sensed it was racially motivated, and I think she did too. And that's why she was nervous and acting the way she was. And, you know, everybody was uncomfortable except for that bigot. And so this guy kept turning around and looking at me, and he had this smirk on his face, a little smile, a little smirk. And it angered me. And I think he knew it, and so he kept doing it. Because, you know, I'm in this aisle, and I'm uncomfortable and I'm making other people uncomfortable because they're walking by me and I got to step out the way. And finally, um, you know, this white woman um, chastised me, talked to me like I was less than dirt, you know, told me to get out the way, move out the aisle. And why don't I sit in my own assigned seat? What am I doing? I'm holding everything up. And so... I politely told her that that guy right there is sitting in my assigned seat and he refuses to move and the stewardess is not, you know, told me to wait and find another seat. So I have to wait for everybody to sit down until, you know, I could find my seat. And she looked at the guy. I guess at that point she was going to be my, 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 she looked at the guy. He turned his head, looked and did that little smirk on his face. And she looked at me and said, oh, and, you know, that was it. There was no apology. I'm sorry, young man. I shouldn't have talked to you. None of that. It was like, oh, well, let me tell you something. And, and the stewardess did. She kept bringing me drinks and telling me, oh, you're such a great sport. And you're the, let me tell you something. That flight would bother me for years. I mean, for years. Sometimes I couldn't sleep at night. I'm thinking about that guy's smirk and that face and the way he turned and just the way I was treated overall. And I thought, I said, man, do I need therapy? Do I need to talk to somebody? Because I could not let it go. So let's move ahead a few years. You know, I graduated from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. I moved to Washington, D.C. And I went on this job interview in Northern Virginia and I had a great interview. I mean, and I was in a great mood. Um, I got on the D.C. Metro um, in Northern Virginia, going back home, and there was only one seat available. And as people know, in that part of town, you know, that whole car was white. The, you know, at that point, you know, th it was all white, white people. I was the only black person. And so I see that there's only one seat available. And I walk to the seat and this woman looks at me and promptly pop, plops her pocketbook down in the seat before I could sit down. And, um, you know, as I look at her and I promptly pick up her pocketbook and I plop it in her lap, <laughs> you know, cause at this point I'm not playing. And then I sat down and I didn't let it go. Cause I was, I was really pissed off. Um, you know, because I, I was very polite, you know, I, you know, and all that. But, you know, when she said, you know, so she tells me, she says, you can't sit here because <clears throat> I'm afraid of black people. And I told her, I said, you know what? You should have thought about that before you got your butt on public transportation <laughs> and walk, on, a, on a train going to Washington, D.C. And we're talking late 80s, you know, it's still almost Chocolate City, you know, so it's, it's lightening up a little bit, but it's still kind of chocolate. DC is still kind of Chocolate City. And I told her that. And I said, you you want to, if you have that fear of black people, maybe you should have caught a, a cab, a private car, a limousine, but no, you're on public transportation just like me. So that tells you something. And she gasped, looked at me with disgust. I didn't care. You know, who, you know, and so I'm thinking, you know, I could feel the silence on that train. And then I feel this tap on my shoulder from behind me. 
And I'm thinking, oh, shoot, it's about to go down. I'm the only black guy on this car. And this basically racial situation happened. And I was hyped because I figured it was about to go down. I already started started what I started. You know, what's up? Let's get it on. And I was still, I was still a little pissed off. And so, you know, I kind of told myself, never again will I let anyone devalue, underestimate, marginalize me without a fight. I, um, the, so anyway, this, this tap on, I feel the tap on my shoulder. I think it's about to go down. I turn around and it's a frail, elderly white woman. And she points her finger in my face and I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. And she says, young man, good for you. Good for you. And she's shaking. Good for you. Good for you. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, the whole car, I could hear the murmur and the talk. And, the, and it got to a fervor pitch where people are saying, oh, that's ridiculous. What, what year are we in now? Oh, my God. That woman's ridiculous. And, I, and at the next stop, this woman jumps up and bolts out the, the car, get, get trained and gets on another car. And she's crying in tears and in red. And I'm telling you, I felt so that the, whoever that woman was behind me who gave me that gentle tap and that word of encouragement, she restored my faith in humanity, you know. But at that point, you know, I I wasn't going to allow myself to be put through anything anymore. Um, I and and so that was my experience. I sleep well because I refuse to compromise who I am for anybody. Now, I'm not saying fight all the time. You'll be fighting every microaggression. That's it. But there's, there's a time when you're going to have to stand up for yourself because if you don't, nobody else will. I think people were waiting around to see how I was going to react before they reacted. Um, I believe that that is what this movie was trying to say. Um, that many times we as black people in white spaces are expected to appease white people, move out of their way, do things to accommodate them, make them feel comfortable when they are uncomfortable. You're in the elevator and a white woman clutches her pocketbook. You tell a stupid joke or whatever because you're a big black guy and you want her to feel good. Nah, that ain't happening. I don't grin when it's not funny. I don't scratch when I don't itch. and I don't shuffle when I could walk with a perfect gait. I don't shut and I don't jive. And when I need to get somewhere, I get in my car and I drive. So I generously give this movie three, and I mean three out of five fat fingers. I, I thought about two, but I did like um, what, what David Allen Greer had to say. I did like his um, piece. And in the end, when Aaron, you know, did his little soliloquy about, you know, not, you know, that basically stating that there is a place for him on this planet. Um, I, I thought that that was a redeeming piece. Um, I wouldn't recommend the, the pay to see that movie. You know, uh, I could be insulted at home. <laughs> I, I mean, let it stream, check it out if you want to. If you want to go to the movie and check it out, just know that I, what I told you, I warned you. Um, the movie didn't hit like it could have, um, and that's, that's all I have to say on that. And so if you like the content that I'm providing, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and like this video. I'm done. Peace. I'm out.